Hello everyone, you are watching Let's Talk About Nephilim. Now first of all I want to take two things off the table. In this video I'm not going to be talking about whether the Nephilim existed or not. That point is pretty clear in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. In the Hebrew it actually uses the word Nephilim. Nephilim is a Hebrew word. In chapter 6 verse 4 of Genesis, in certain versions like the King James Version, it translates the Hebrew word Nephilim as giants. So clearly the Nephilim did exist. The second thing I'm not going to be talking about in this video is whether the sons of God were demons or humans or something else. I wrote an article that talks about that and it addresses different ideas of who the sons of God are and it tries to give the positives of that of each theory and the negatives of each theory. So I'm not going to be talking about that in this video. The four things I would like to address is one, why did God send the flood? Because there are um, a lot of people on YouTube who believe uh, that the flood was sent to destroy the Nephilim specifically, that it wasn't intended for man, that it was intended for the Nephilim, or it was sent specifically because of the Nephilim, perhaps. The second thing I'd like to address is, did the flood destroy the Nephilim, or did they get away? The third thing I'd like to address is, did the Nephilim exist in Moses' time? in the land of Canaan when the Israelites came to conquer Canaan were the Nephilim in the land. And then the fourth thing I'd like to address is are the Nephilim coming back? Now those four things are very very popular on YouTube and bear with me I'm going to perhaps seem a little countercultural uh, in this way on YouTube but I would like you to just focus on what it says and uh, the intent of this video is to just draw out what scripture is saying to clear up um, things that have been taken out of context and to, instead of focusing on what we believe, focus on what the Bible literally says. Okay? So that's the point of this video. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, I'm just going to start in verse 1, it says, when men began to multiply on the surface of the ground, and daughters were born to them, God's sons saw that men's daughters were beautiful, and they took any that they wanted for themselves as wives. The Lord said, My, st my spirit will not strive with man's forever, because he also is flesh, so his days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when God's sons came into men's daughters and had children with them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was continually only evil. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the surface of the ground, man, along with animals, creeping things, and birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the Lord's eyes. So, looking at this, specifically starting in verse 5, the focus is on man. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. The wickedness of man. So we're not talking here about the Nephilim being giants and corrupting man. We're talking about man being not in the process of being corrupted, not in the process of being ruled and conquered by these Nephilim and being afflicted by these Nephilim. We're talking about man himself being wicked. So that, as it says, every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was continually only evil. So that makes it very clear that whoever the Nephilim were, whatever position they were in the earth, whether they were kings, conquerors, um, people who were just warriors, uh, anarchists, whatever. Whoever the Nephilim were, 
that's not the focus of Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 7. The focus is man and his wickedness, whether man includes Nephilim or doesn't. The focus is on man, that's clear. It also says the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And in verse 7, when it tells us, when God says to himself, essentially, that he would destroy the things that live on the earth, the focus is again on man. It says, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the surface of the ground. Man, along with animals, in other words, the animals, the creeping things, and birds of the sky are secondary. They're not the reason why he's going to destroy everything on the earth. It's man. I will destroy man whom I have created from the surface of the ground. And then it says, but Noah found favor in the Lord's eyes. And obviously Noah was a man. So that's why it points out, because if God is going to destroy the whole earth because of man, then people would wonder, why was Noah spared? Verse 8 answers it. Noah, being a man, despite the destruction of every other man, found favor in the Lord's eyes. Therefore, him and his immediate family were spared. Now, in Genesis chapter 7, so that answers, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, answers why was the flood sent. It was not sent because of demons or because of giants uh, without having anything to do with everyone else. In other words, if you lived being the height that you are, being the person that you are, being a descendant as you are of man, if you lived in Noah's time and you were just like everyone else who also was a descendant of man, you would be destroyed as well. It has nothing to do with whether they were Nephilim or not. There's no distinction there. It doesn't say the Nephilim at all, in fact. So, uh, clearly it was man. Whether Nephilim are man and are included in that statement or excluded from that statement, it doesn't matter. The point is, God sent the flood to destroy man. So now in Genesis chapter 4, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 7 verse 4, it says, and this is God speaking to, Mo, um, to Noah, it says, In seven days I will call it, cause it to rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights. Every living thing that I have made, I will destroy from the surface of the ground. Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him. And then it talks about um, how Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came on the earth. Uh, Noah went into the ark with his wife and his son's wives and his sons um, because of the flood waters. And it talks about, um, it, starting in verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second, uh, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep were burst open, and the sky's windows were opened. It rained on the earth forty days and forty nights. Um, and then in verse, here we go, in verse 21 it says, All flesh died that moved on the earth, including birds, livestock, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life was the breath of the spirit of life died every living thing was destroyed that was on the surface of the ground including man livestock creeping things and birds of the sky they were destroyed from the earth only noah was left and those who were with him in the ship the waters flooded the earth 150 days so it repeats itself which means that it's putting an emphasis on how everything died that was on the face of the earth. All flesh died that moved on the earth. And it says, including birds, livestock, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. Essentially, everything. All on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. Now, when it says the breath of the spirit of life, that means everything that's alive. That's You could take that as a um, basically just a, a, a word picture. Everything that breathes, everything that's alive, everything that has life, died. Every living thing was destroyed that was on the surface of the ground, including man, livestock, creeping thing, and birds of the sky. So there's clearly a strong emphasis on everything on earth was dead 
was destroyed by the flood. It says only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ship. So the focus again is on man. It doesn't mention it doesn't mention fallen angels. It doesn't say anything like that. It's all on man. And it says that everything that was on the earth at that time who had that had the breath of life within them of the spirit of life died. So perhaps someone could say, oh, well, maybe the Nephilim, being the sons of fallen angels, first of all, they're not man, and it doesn't mention them, so that doesn't necessarily mean they died. Well, yeah, but the problem with that is that even though it doesn't mention them, it says all flesh died. Would the Nephilim be flesh? Yes. Would they have breath in their nostrils, whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life? Did they breathe? Yes, they died. Every living thing was destroyed that was on the surface of the ground. Were they on the surface of the ground? Yes, they died. So some people would say, okay, but maybe they left because Noah was on the earth building the ark for about 120 years, right? So they had time to leave before the flood came. Now, that's reasonable because of the fact that the flood was not made for them. Or at least, if they if they are the sons of demons and women, then the flood wasn't made for them. Because remember, in Genesis chapter six, verse four, or vor, verses um, six through seven, it talks about how God God is focusing on man and how man is evil. So if the Nephilim are not man, then the flood was not made for them. Now that might seem backwards to you to think, okay, so the sons of demons. The flood came to destroy man, but not the sons of demons. Well, it is what it is, but that's what the Bible says. It's focused on man. Now, if you believe that the Nephilim are man, then that makes more sense because it includes them. But I'm just going to leave it open to you to believe what you want to believe on that subject for now. We're not going to focus on that. But here, it says that everything that was on earth was destroyed. So if the Nephilim were sons of demons and they did have spaceships or, or whatever, or they could fly or whatever, and they somehow left Earth, that's a possibility as long as God did not try to destroy them. Because if we were to say that the flood came to destroy Nephilim and the Nephilim escaped the flood, that is to say that God somehow missed. Like he sent an earthquake and oops, they're earthquake proof. That doesn't make any sense. That's to say that God is impotent. And God is not impotent. He is all powerful. So to say that is to essentially make God a little God instead of a big God. If he created all of existence, the earth, the solar system, the universe, how could he miss the Nephilim? when they're little itty bitty beings that are flying away from an earth on spaceships. How could he miss them? That doesn't make any sense. So it's possible that they did fly away if they were the sons of demons, but only because one, they had 120 years to leave, assuming they're the sons of demons, of course. And two, because Genesis chapter six verses, I think six and seven, uh, focuses on man. So in other words, God did not send the flood to destroy Nephilim if, again, they are the sons of fallen angels. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about um, let's talk about during Moses' day. Now, a lot of people who talk about Nephilim, they say, oh, the Nephilim were in Canaan. And that's the reason, that is the reason why Canaan, why all the people of Canaan were to be killed. Uh, the men, the children, and the women. So they use that as essentially an excuse. Uh, I don't personally believe that, but I'm going to get into why in this video. And again, you can make your own decision. I'm just showing you what scripture says, and the point of this video is that we can come to scripture, forget about our preconceived ideas, forget about how uh, what people say about scripture, forget about um, taking things out of context or anything like that, let's just focus on scripture, see what it says, and then apply scripture to what we think instead of applying what we think to scripture. Scripture is 
you can't take things out of context. You have to deal with what it says. So that's what we're going to do. In Numbers chapter 13, verses 21 to start off, uh, it says, So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob, to the entrance of Hamath. They went up by the south and came to Hebron and Nahaman and Sheshai and Telmai. The children of Anak were there. And then it talks about, uh, verse 23, They came to the valley of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bore it on a staff between two. So a lot of people believe that was a large cluster of grapes that they had to to uh, carry it on a staff between two people. Uh, that's reasonable to assume, but it is somewhat of an assumption, so I wouldn't get too carried away with that. Uh, they also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. So obviously, if we were able to assume that the uh, cluster of grapes was really large for them to be forced to bear it on a staff between two people, we could also assume that these pomegranates and figs are small because it doesn't mention that they had to carry it with two people or large baskets and they probably didn't even have large baskets with them. Or maybe they did because maybe they were planning on cutting things down and bringing it back. But in any case, uh, it continues on and then verse 26 it says, They went and came to Moses, to Aaron, and to all the children of the, all the congregation of the children of Israel. Um, the wilderness of Paran uh, to Kadesh and brought back word to them and all the congregation. They showed them the fruit of the land to show them what was in the land, what it was like, what they would inherit when they conquered those people. They told him and said, We came to the land where you sent us. Surely it flows with milk and honey, which is a good thing, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Apparently, Moses and the uh, children of Israel should be able to recognize by the name who the children of Anak were. Amalek dwells in the land of the south. The Hittite, the Jebusite, and the Amorite dwell in the hill country. The Canaanite dwells by the sea and along the side of the Jordan. Now, God had already told them about these people, whether they knew about them from Egypt. Maybe they had heard of these people from Egypt. Uh, or not, God was mentioning them in uh, Exodus several times. So these people are not a surprise, like, oh, these people are there, the, Am the Amalekites, I didn't know that. Uh, now it says, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. And then it says, But the men who went up with him said, We aren't able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. They brought up an evil report to the land, of the land which they had spied out to the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that eats up its inhabitants. All the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the Nephilim, the son of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. We are in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So here we see in verse 33 the word Nephilim again. A lot of people say that uh, verse 33 means, because it uses the word Nephilim, clearly the Nephilim survived the flood. But is that exactly the case? Notice that in verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. So Caleb is trying to give the people courage. He's saying, he's not denying that the sons of Anak are in the land, or the sons of An Amalek. Uh, he's not denying the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Canaanites dwell in the land. He's saying they may be there, or he's not denying that they are there, but he's saying let us go up because we can possess it, we can overcome. And then it says the other men who were with him, excluding Joshua, uh, went uh, uh, said that we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are and it says they brought up an evil report of the land which they had spied out to the children of israel so these people are trying to discourage the people by emphasizing the uh the height of the uh d those who dwell in the land and the power and um 
the walls that they would not be able to scale and things like that. It says the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that eats up its inhabitants. In other words, we cannot live there. We will be eaten up, essentially. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we will be eaten by giants. It means that it's hostile. It's a hostile land. We cannot go there, otherwise we will be destroyed. And all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. Notice that he says all of the people we saw in it are men of great stature. They are emphasizing the negatives of going up. They're saying, we cannot go up. We will be destroyed. There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. They mention Anak in verse 28, uh, who come from the Nephilim. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, does this mean that the Nephilim, that the, An the sons of Anak, literally were descendants of Nephilim? Again, not necessarily, because these people, these uh, other spies, I believe there was 12 spies, so this is the, uh, minus the two that supported going up, Caleb and Joshua, there's 10 spies that are against going up, and they're trying to convince the people to turn away. And so they are emphasizing uh, the negatives of going up. They're stronger than we are. Um, the land eats up its inhabitants. It's hostile, whether that be from the other people living there, the animals. Um, maybe, maybe people will starve because there's not enough uh, food. Generally, it's hostile. Of course, we know there's plenty of food because they brought back food. But they're saying it's hostile. And all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature, all of them. Not just some of them, not just certain people, all of them. And then finally they say, there we saw the Nephilim. You know those guys that you heard about in Genesis, the book that uh, um, Moses wrote? And uh, there we've had ancient reports from a long time ago, um, stories of these beings called Nephilim that were really tall and and they ruled the world during uh, Noah's time. Well, the, Anak, the sons of Anak are descendants of the Nephilim. So they're, they're making, they're emphasizing all of these negative things. And I ask, just generally, if Moses and if the children of Israel knew that the sons of Anak were Nephilim, then I have to ask, why did these spies bring up that the sons of Anak were the children of Nephilim if they already knew because if they already knew it wouldn't be a surprise so there's two possibilities one they either brought up that the sons of Anak are the children of Nephilim because they already knew but they were just bringing it out for emphasis or two the, son, uh, the children of Israel knew, didn't know that the sons of Anak were the children of Nephilim. And these spies are calling them the children of Nephilim, not because they're d the literal descendants of Nephilim, but because the sons of Anak are big, as just like the Nephilim are said to be big. So in other words, the sons of Anak have the characteristics of the Nephilim who they heard about a long time ago from ancient stories. Now, throughout the Old Testament, uh, we see people being called sons of someone else, even if they're not the literal descendants of them. So that is a, pro a very possible interpretation. There are people who are called sons of so-and-so uh, because they have, because so-and-so uh, started a certain trade, like for example, the metal trade uh, in Genesis chapter four, I believe there was someone who is called the father of the metal workers. Now that could be taken literally as in all of his children were metal workers and that's fine. But uh, in Hebrew, the word son or descendant could be used uh, not literally, but um, essentially. So in other words, based on your traits. Uh, it's just like in the New Testament, how Jesus calls the Jews sons of Satan. He's not literally calling them sons of the devil. He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. But instead, you are the devil's children because you do what the devil does, which is oppose God's work. And I know I'm taking that out of 
context. In other words, I'm not showing you exactly what it says and I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but go look for that yourself and you will see that what I just said is exactly what Jesus was implying or saying. Um, so it's very possible that by saying that the sons of Anak are children of the Nephilim, that they're not talking about literal descendants of the Nephilim, but they're talking about uh, based on their height. They're like the Nephilim, therefore they're, they're, they are essentially their sons. The other possibility, as I said, is that the children of Israel knew, knew that the sons of Anak were the sons of the Nephilim, uh, and these spies are just bringing it up. So I'll just leave that out in the air. Uh, I think it's the second option that the sons of Anak are not literally the sons of the Nephilim, but just like them. And the spies are just saying they're like the Nephilim. They are essentially the Nephilim because of their height. All right, I'll just leave that up in the air. But the fourth thing that I wanted to bring up is a lot more clear than the third point. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 37, and then continuing, a lot of people say that uh, the days of Noah will be in the end times. Therefore, because the Nephilim were in the days of Noah, the Nephilim will be in the end times. Now, let me read it. It starts in uh, verse 37. It says, As the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ship, and they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I ask you, does that really sound like it's saying, Oh no, the Nephilim are coming? Not really. If you, if you read, instead of just reading verse 37, even verse 37 taken by itself, if you really think about it, it doesn't say anything about Nephilim at all. It doesn't even imply it. In fact, it implies something different. It says, As the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It doesn't say, so will be the days of the Son of Man. It says, so will be the coming of the Son of Man, which suggests something different than what most people, uh, m whether on purpose or accidentally, misinterpret uh, this section. And then it continues, for as in those days, as in those days, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage. So the focus is saying, as in the days before the flood, when they were marrying, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, so will it be in the uh, at the coming of the Son of Man. Until the day that Noah entered into the ship. That's how it was. That's the focus. Not Nephilim. Otherwise it would just say, For as in those days which were before the flood, when the Nephilim were on the earth, uh, until that day that Noah entered into the ship, that's what it would say. It wouldn't say, For as in those days uh, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. It has nothing to do with Nephilim. It's focusing on what man was doing. Not what kind of man was on earth or whether demon, half demon, half human people were on earth, it's focused on what man was doing. It did, and they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Again, the focus is on man. And then continuing in verse 40, it says, Then two men shall be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Watch, therefore, for you don't know in what hour your Lord comes. That is the focus. He's saying that people are going about on their, in their everyday business. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying, they're giving, in, giving in, uh, their children, their daughters in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ship. They're doing their everyday lives. They're acting as if there's nothing that's going to happen to them. That's the focus. They're, act, they're doing joyous things. Eating and drinking is something that is joyous. It's not something that's sorrowful. If you were sorry, you might not even eat or drink. You certainly wouldn't go to a marriage, and you certainly wouldn't be marrying people and, and giving your daughters in marriage if it was a very sorrowful time and you knew that you were about to be destroyed. So, verse uh, 40, 42 solidifies it very clearly. 
Watch therefore, for you don't know in what hour your Lord comes, in the same way that the people in Noah's day were ignorant and did not realize that the flood was coming, or uh, if they had heard, they didn't believe it. In that same way, people today will be ignorant that the day of the Lord is about to happen, or if they did know, they will be ignorant, or they will, uh, they will not believe it. In the same way, so the focus is not on Nephilim. It's not on even even the evil that was going on in Noah's day. The focus is on the fact that the people were either ignorant, they did not know that the day of the Lord was about to occur, or they didn't believe it. And so they continue to eat and drink and enjoy themselves and marry women and give their daughters in marriage. Day-to-day -day life, life goes on will eat and drink and have fun that kind of an attitude that's what jesus's point is and then in verse 43 he says but know this that if the master of the house had known in what watch of the night the thief was coming he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken into therefore also be ready for in an hour that you don't expect the son of man will come again the focus is on being ready, realizing that the day of the Lord will come, that we should be watchful because we don't know exactly when it will come, but we should be paying attention. And the connection point, the connection point between Noah's day and, and the end days is the fact that people will be ignorant of it and, and will be going about their daily lives and enjoying themselves. They will be marrying and giving their, giving their daughters in marriage as if destruction is not imminent. That's the focus. Nothing to do with the Nephilim. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Uh, I, I encourage you to look at these, chat, uh, these verses, passages that I've brought up. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through, uh, through 8. Uh, Genesis chapter 7, verses 4 through 24. Uh, Numbers chapter 13 verses 21 through 33 and Matthew chapter 24 verses uh, 37 through uh, 44 because and, and to look at those verses those passages and decide for yourself what it says however you are accountable for what you believe so make sure that you're not believing in fairy tales don't believe something just because you want to because that is that's a lie so don't don't put yourself in that position where you're believing a lie on purpose knowingly which in that case you almost wouldn't even really be believing it you would be pretending that is fake religion do not do not put yourself in a position where that is your religion where you're believing a lie okay Make sure you see what does the Bible say and how can I deal with that? How can I grasp that? How, what does it say? How can I put that into my life? How can I handle that? But whatever you do, you can change the way you think. And that's fine. But do not change what the scripture says because that is lying. And that is false religion. That is... Um, essentially believing in fairy tales. Don't do that, okay? All right, thank you for watching, everyone. I hope you have a good day or a good night. Thanks.